Welcome to uh, the Mindy Indie Showcase Dev Convo. My name is Kyle. Alongside me on the 6-1 side is Harry Eloazidis, our editor-in-chief. Hello. And today we're talking with the devs behind Slay the Princess, uh, Black Tabby Games, Tony and Abby. Tony and Abby, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so obviously we'll get into Slay the Princess because it's super, super cool. But I want to get to know you guys first. Uh, where did your game dev journey start? Did you always want to be a... Uh, game dev people no it was an accident or a strange serendipitous turn of events you, yeah, you very usually spontaneous. want to tell the story <laughs> we were um so i was wrapping up a graphic novel i had a few more months of work on that and then tony was winding down a, a startup, tech startup, yeah, yeah. tech startup and we were at new york city comic-con and got talking with a friend about visual novels and then just turned to each other and we're like we could probably make one of those. So it just kind of snowballed Sweet. from there. We started work on Scarlet Hollow as soon as I was done work on my graphic novel, which was The Crossroads of Midnight. It's a good one. <laughs> and yeah, uh, awesome. Slay the Princess is something that we started specifically because we wanted, well, Tony's marketing time was probably better spent just making a second game, is what Tony thought. And if we could like make something with minimal art assets then my time wouldn't be taken up so that i could work on scarlet hollow and say the princess at once yeah minimal sure has changed in <laughs> sure has. but uh scarlet hollow was a first game was a and still is a ridiculously ambitious concept especially from a business perspective where mm -hmm. it's an episodic visual novel it's living in early access we take the branching narrative extremely seriously and we take um, you know, the immersion of the visual art aspect of it very seriously, such yeah. that, like... Making sure characters exist in the backgrounds, mm -hmm. or if they're doing something that is shown instead of just saying, and now suspend your disbelief as this still sprite is described as mixing something in a bowl or walking mm -hmm. into a different room. Right. So it's like there's four of our seven episodes done right now. That's... 585,000 words of writing and something like 8,000 art assets. Um, and the way our workflow wound up developing, like uh, we co-write the script and we figure out the story beats together, but Abby always does the first draft on that one. And then when she's done with that first draft, I go in, I make my edits, I make my additions, I put it into the engine, but like there was this dead zone where it would take her like, you know, it takes you three to five months to write an episode of the game at this point. Yeah. And during that time, I would mostly be trying to figure out how do we keep the lights on? How do we keep the business running? And, and especially... The word out there. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and like for the month leading up to the release of an episode like i was just too busy coding to do too much on the marketing side the month following a release was usually great but then there was just this terrible uphill struggle the of quagmire. right like okay so there's four months of abby scripting we need to keep our revenue going but we don't have marketing beats or we don't even have new art assets at this point to make it exciting to continue selling the game so it was a lot of just like cold emailing streamers and uh, and figuring out like little community engagement things to do to move the needle and it was this huge exhausting thing and there was a moment where I was just like I could just write a second game and write that script while Abby's doing this script and then if we just keep it to like one location one visible character um it'll be manageable and we can with some difficulty juggle juggle those two at once but it's going to be better for the survival of our studio than um Just... me screaming into the void and emailing a vaguely relevant twitch streamer um yeah, you know, the same pitch for the and eighth time. That has worked. Yeah, well, it's worked. <laughs> nice, good. I that was going to be my second question. For everybody. <laughs> yeah, like... Uh... But, like, Scarlet Hollow sales shot up oh, when yeah. Slay the Princess was announced. It's continued to just feed into Scarlet Hollow and, the, you know, vice yeah. versa. So, it was yeah, good. <laughs> like, the first three episodes of Scarlet Hollow were a... Just a long process of slowly eating into the savings we had from the Kickstarter campaign. And now we have wages. 
Nice. Which is great. Yay. Yeah. It's so, awesome. All working out. On, on the on the back of that um, of of the success of Scarlet Scarlet Hollow and uh, after unveiling Slay the Princess, we were at PAX East, and uh, I don't know if you've you've heard about it. I'm sure you have, but like everyone we talked to, absolutely loved Slay the Princess. So how how was that like getting that kind of feedback from from people playing actually playing the game in a in a it con was... setting? incredible that was uh, a little dissociative yeah because we of course, <laughs> sure, i can like, imagine we started our game company during the pandemic yeah. we haven't been mm-hmm. to game events we haven't seen people's reactions to the game in real time so mm-hmm. we had no idea what to expect yeah. we fully were expecting to just be passed over by most people uh that was not the case <laughs> right and we're also used to scarlet hollow being a game that like i think it's a pretty good game but it's a it's a hard one to demo in yeah. public mm-hmm. spaces it's not voice acted it takes a while for like the plot to ramp up and for you to get to know the characters and be fully immersed. Whereas Slay the Princess almost accidentally um, is something that just like the first five seconds grabs people. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was, I don't know, it was a very cool experience. Yeah, it was very uh, unreal at the end. We had people coming up saying, Everyone had been talking about us. We hadn't been going out or talking to anybody, so we didn't know. Yeah, I didn't get to check out anything on the show floor because the booth needed to be manned the whole time. Oh, yeah. terrible. Yeah. Oh, no. Awful <laughs> problem um, uh, Where was it going to go with that? Oh, uh, the, the my favorite thing about like watching the trailer, I did not get a chance to play your game at PAX, but uh, I love the mix of humor and horror together, and, and they kind of mix well. What, what goes into adding humor into something that's uh, a little bit scary and something that Harry's not a big fan of over yeah. here. Or, or did you start the opposite way and, mm. and like sprinkle it in? Like, how did you, how did you start? And then how did you end up getting to where you are? I'm always so the, fascinated by that. Kind yeah, of stuff. this is, this is pretty interesting. I usually start from the humor side of things. And, nice. Um, I wrote the sort of draft of the first, demo for Slay the Princess when Abby was visiting her family. So it was just like, it was over a black background except for the good ending screen, which I drew myself and procreate. Um, And it's 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 I, yeah, it's, it's a perfect, it's beautiful it's, work it's of art. I insisted Tony art in keep game, it. For sure. Tony wanted um, me to draw one and I'm like, I'm not replacing your art. But it's anyway, good. yeah. But um, <laughs> Yeah, th- th- there's a baseline horror to the situation. Like, it usually moves in monstrous directions, but it was a lot more um, lighthearted and pining in that first draft. And then Abby started to draw the art for it, and uh, Brandon started to do the music for it. And uh, it took a much more horrific turn. And I think, like, that dialogue of all the different voices that have influenced the art in different ways uh, really elevated it. But we of course, also, I've been yeah. working in horror and humor for my whole career. Forever, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Are those are those what most of your uh, your cartoons and books are are like horror based, Abby? Uh, I would yeah, do the say full so. pitch. Yeah, so I started yeah. with Junior Scientist Power Hour, which is a gag comic, but then that one increasingly took more and more and morbid turns as it went on. Uh, Then there's The Last Halloween, which is very much horror and humor, just classic horror comedy and adventure. And then uh, I did a whole series that was neither horror nor, well, I guess it was kind of funny, but it was more educational. It was about dinosaurs for kids. Uh, I went to school for evolutionary biology, so that's my background. So I did a whole series, uh, Earth Before Us. And then after that, I was like, I'm done with that. That's all the information I had. That was all I ever learned. So I'm back to horror forever. So then I did The Crossroads at Midnight and will continue to do horror for the rest of my life. It's uh, Sweet. my favorite thing to do. Awesome. Yeah, uh, and we were we were looking at the store earlier and we were just so impressed by so many of the pins and the art styles of everything. Um, so it was really fun to see your whole discography upon all the, I guess, not genres, but all the mediums that are available mm-hmm. to you. So snaps yeah. to that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And uh, I think a lot of people talk about this, but horror and humor are just exceptionally good bedfellows in mm-hmm. general at mm-hmm. their core. They 
play with the unexpected to force people to engage with things in different ways than they normally engage with them yeah, and to to invoke a visceral reaction yeah either one of just like this is the silliest thing i've ever seen or this is deeply unsettling to me just right and they both surprising can, you they both can off shift balance like the emotional balance of playing something or reading something in different directions Mm -hmm. Uh, which means that they're really great amplifying forces. I know, like with Scarlet Hollow, mm -hmm. it's th there's an unsettling air for the first hour and change of the first episode, but I remember when that one first came out, um, by the time streamers would get to the horror elements, they would have forgotten that it was a horror game, and it meant that mm -hmm. that sudden shift in tone landed a lot more effectively for them. Oh yeah, I I had similar experiences when I played uh, Doki Doki Literature Club. I was just gonna say that. <laughs> where I was like, oh, this is a cute little fun thing, and then all of a sudden, when it takes a turn, oh. it takes a turn. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's really awesome, and I get those kind of same vibes for like the trailer, uh, especially when the princess, you know, starts ripping through the screen, and, mm -hmm. and it's like evil all of a sudden <laughs> it gets intense yeah it gets very very intense um what uh what about a narrative game is so appealing like is it because of your background of working in, in more of a book and cartoon effort uh, or area or is it just like narrative is super important to you uh, in the art that you make uh, yes i would absolutely say so yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. stories are very important to me narratives are important to me. I don't think I could ever work on something that didn't have a very intense narrative. And I mean, the, the nature of both of these narratives is that they are very complex, very character driven, very uh, player driven. So that is a very interesting thing to work with. And that's kind of where my focus as a games person is. Right. Like they're not pre-made stories that are refitted to work with games. They are stories written with the medium in mind. So it would be hard nice. to squish them onto something else and then i think something that's also very important when you make any kind of art and especially when you make games is to lean into your own strengths and to know your own strengths well enough to lean into them i think we both knew when we got started that designing unique and compelling like normal gameplay mechanics is not a strength of ours um but we're both people who have spent a lot of time in our lives thinking about stories and telling stories and shaping them um so we made a very conscious decision at the beginning of it of these are going to strictly be visual novels there won't be any mini games or extra mechanics outside of the complexity of choice and then all of our extra resources that we would have otherwise been spending on, uh, I don't know, building a pinball machine or something, uh, instead are spent on how can we more intricately map the relationship dynamics between characters in our stories and between those characters and the player, and how can we make the impact of every dialogue choice sort of snowball into something bigger and bigger over the course of the story. Awesome. So there are there any games that you guys have played recently that evoke the things that you're trying to invoke in your game, whether it's indie, non-indie, that have that cool either visual storytelling aspects or the story, character, player-driven mechanics that you're, you're driving about? Um, yeah, I guess in terms of influences uh disco elysium is a strong one um the stanley parable is a strong one um abby is just asking me if we're muted, muted because uh the little the little lines, lines aren't, aren't running on our, they're showing on our oh no you're, you're good we can hear it zencaster is a little weird with that okay, okay but it is okay. recording <laughs> us right yeah, okay, it good. should be recording. Absolutely. I can see your lines. I can see. Okay. You can see our lines. Okay. Just as we can. Okay. You can keep no. this Thank in you. here. Yeah. It's humanized. Yeah, we are. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for um, asking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Of course. Okay. Yeah. So Disco Elysium is a big one. Um, 
Stanley Parable, I think, is a pretty evident um, influence on Slay the Princess uh, for my contributions to Scarlet Hollow. Um, kind of that middle years period for Bioware has been mm. hugely influential um, to sort of like Mass Effect 1 through 3, Knights of the Old Republic, um, the first two Dragon Ages. Um, okay, sweet. God, I feel like there's every t we get this question so many times, <laughs> and every time I'm just Sorry. like, <laughs> "Oh no, it's okay. It's just I'm sure you yeah. understand." Suddenly, you forget every game oh, you yeah. ever played, right? Um, <laughs> and then I think <laughs> there's, uh, there's what are words? That I, did you mention that one? No, you, no, I did not mention. Uh, Overton. Yeah, these are just a collection of games I really like. Yeah, I have mm -hmm. no idea how much of this is like influencing our game versus just kind of. Right. all of the other shit that i read <laughs> i think uh something that's interesting too is like influences don't stop when you start working on something and often new influences come in as you consume or reconsume other media during the process like it feels at this point like i hadn't played it by the time we started work on slay the princess but now like there's some decently strong influences from Soma. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Guy drawing another blank. They ate so many good games. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> there are way too many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. What is, uh, I just realized uh, before I even asked that question, we didn't let you uh, talk about what Slay the Princess is. If someone's okay. stumbling across this interview before they watch the showcase or the trailer or whatever, how would you describe what Slay the Princess is? Slay the Princess starts with the player waking up in the woods and a mysterious narrator telling her, telling you that if you do not slay this princess, she will end the world. And from there, it's up to you what to do with that information. You can choose to simply run away. You can choose to just do what he says, or you can choose to just... Uh, try to be her friend perhaps and all of these consequences lead to very different outcomes yes yeah. it's um it's an exercise in the way our decisions shape our perception of the world mm -hmm. and how they shape our our relationships with the people we share that with Awesome. If that's not a box quote, <laughs> that was <laughs> awesome. I'm like, I'm trying to remember what you just said. I'm like, all right, I'm going to write that down after the recording. That was really, that was awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, what is, what is something that you're excited for people to experience in the game? Is there like a moment that you're hoping people freak out about, or is it just simply just playing? There's, there's quite a few there's that so we many. cannot talk yeah. about. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, one of the biggest challenges to marketing uh, games where there's like a core mystery mm -hmm. at the heart of it, where it's mm -hmm. like, oh, I know the things that would immediately sell people on this, but I can't. Even yeah. with Scarlet Hollow, it's like we have a moratorium on posting a lot of the really, really interesting hooks from mm. the middle chapters because... Mm -hmm. We just want people to be able to go into those blind. And something I really like is that um, sort of the fan community for that game has been excellent at respecting those boundaries. Like, That's they awesome. are so, so good at not spoiling those big reveals. Great. So with such a story-driven game, how do you decide what to show off and what to hold back? while also doing like the, the give and take on like, I want to make sure they're interested, but not give away all the cool stuff. So thankfully, Abby's art is fantastic. Thank you. So <laughs> a lot of times we can wow, just yeah. uh, share some completely out of context visuals. Yeah, because there um, is a lot of art in the game um, for a lot of different variations. So there's no guarantee that even if you're going down a certain path, you'll see in fact, there is not a guarantee whatsoever that you will see all of the art that was yeah. made for that path. So there's a lot to draw on there and a lot that is just like so out of context that you don't even know how you could possibly get yeah. there. So right. I think like, that helps of just knowing this image will happen in the game at some point. How do you find it? Up to you. So it kind mm. of like gives you a little nugget. Right. Like if somebody with no context can figure a lot out about a revelation from an image, then that's a no-go. 
And then outside of that, something that I do because Scarlet Hollow has such a long tail for marketing is um, we have channels on our Discord server where people can save, share their favorite screenshots. And Steam also has like a little tab of, under every title where people, again, can share screenshots. And on the Steam side, I'll just like go through when it's been long enough since I've shared something and find like, what's the most popular screenshot from the past couple weeks? What's resonated with people? And then is it a spoiler? Yeah, there are some where it's like obvious where you can figure out why everyone is in a certain room, what the room is, and then kind of figure out from there what part of the story it is. But there are others where perhaps it is a background that only appears for two seconds if you make very weird decisions. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then you can't predict where that background is. Nobody could figure it out because it's only in one tiny part of the game. So something like that, that is so far removed from the usual paths is usually what we try to go for. Again, like little gold nuggets that people have to find. And then we also, we love demos. Demos are uh, underrated. Mm -hmm. I think part of the issue with demos, I know that like the industry pulled away from them because AAA studios started to realize that having demos meant that games would typically sell less copies. One, I don't think that's necessarily true for indies because Mm -hmm. for those AAA games, those games always had name recognition and reach, Mm -hmm. whereas a demo can be a way something that doesn't have a lot of recognition suddenly gets it. Mm -hmm. And I think there is also an art to making the kind of demos that want people to keep playing rather than the kind of demos that satisfy their players enough, where it's like, even if they enjoyed the demo itself, they feel fulfilled by what they experience, so they're not going to come back to the full thing. On that note, I think that it can work particularly well for narrative games, uh, Mm -hmm. especially ones that have sort of mysteries at the heart of them, but then you have to really know how to do a good cliffhanger and exactly where to leave things so Mm -hmm. that people are excited they had a great time but then they want more yeah i i just recently played the uh, i don't know if you're familiar with the game sea of stars the upcoming rpg game they they had a demo that was out and they specifically like fast forward through all the story stuff just so like you aren't spoiled when it comes to like the main game and i i love that you still got a taste of it and the beautiful art and music and all that but you'll experience the story on its own when it's out in a few weeks, which is great. Demos are awesome. Mm-hmm. And I'm happy to hear that you are all for them too. Cause I wish they were a thing everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It definitely helped us a lot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you... Our uh, headphones are being weird again. <laughs> oh, no worries. Uh, I hear you perfectly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, that's just um, more about the, um, the no echo. Echo. Uh, yeah. Okay, there we go. You gotcha. All right. Uh, (laughs) Earlier, uh, you mentioned that um, Slay the Princess was kind of, it began around the same time of Scarlet Hollow. Like they were kind of close together. So it started after episode episode three three came out. After episode three, okay. Yeah. Were there any thoughts, or maybe you can't say anything yet, but are they connected in some way? Was it hard to not do that? I will say there are there's a couple dedicated fan theorists on our mm. Discord okay. who are devoted to the idea that they're connected. Um, I tend cannot, to... yeah, canonically I... no. Yeah, but um, I always love to support people who are like, what if all of this one creator's things were connected? I think it's fun for people. So I also think yeah. like even if canonically they're not, usually like there is a. There's a continuity between any mm-hmm. artist or any team's canon where it's like, just clearly, these are the ideas that are important to, you know, these creators. These are the things they want to explore. And you can see that manifest in different ways and change over time, uh, sometimes in more obvious ways than other. Like there's that one guy, what, what, what's his name? The Summer Wars guy. Oh, yeah, the yeah. guy who made the Digimon movie and then has been making the Digimon movie every few years for a while. But it, it was only the <laughs> Digimon movie once. Yeah, he and made Summer Wars. He made uh, Bell? Bell recently. There's another Ooh, one Bell. in here that has a similar idea of what if there was a digital world and people went there 
through video games. Think about it. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. I say That's this great. as a staunch Digimon oh, supporter. Oh yeah, no, I mean this <laughs> yeah. is this is from a position of affection and that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um. Uh, oh my God! I'm why am I blanking so hard? The heat's getting to me. Uh, <laughs> so while while Kyle is formulating his words, uh, I thought maybe we could take a two second pause on talking about Slay the Spire. And can you talk about your three awesome pets? <laughs> Thank you, Harry. That's exactly where I was going to go. <laughs> my three. Uh, because on your website you have like a uh, an adorable drawing on the about me, which is the two of you, as well as your three pets, and I was gushing over how cute this entire scene was um, oh thank you that's yeah. so sweet yes i love them very much they get wonderful treatment here we have our cat spoons she's currently sitting in her tower of pillows on her special <laughs> chair that no one else is allowed to sit on love uh, i have nubs the axolotl who has a massive tank all to herself she's wonderful uh and she has two arms on one side because when she was a little tiny tadpole uh her siblings ate her arm off and it grew back wrong so she's oh, got wow. a long okay. elbow and two functional hands on the end of it love it and then there is wednesday the ball python who i never see but you know that's snakes for you yeah. she's wonderful <laughs> too she's very She's sweet. Awesome. that's awesome nice and i have my buddy vader just snoozing over there I wave, I good. wave to the cat. Oh my god! <laughs> totally so knocked out. So he's just living his best life. I'm glad you picked up on that, Harry, because that is. is oh exactly yeah, no! What I was I, and ask. I, the entire interview, I'm like, <laughs> how can I jump in on this? Like, when can we talk about these cute animals? I care so much about them. I spent the last week like redoing Nubs's Aquascape because I got into having an aquarium at all because of Aquascaping YouTube. So and he's got oh, a piece nice. of driftwood on Could Canadian you, Craigslist. Yeah. <laughs> I had to have that driftwood. <laughs> I can't my fixation. Will they, uh, free will they ever die? show up in a game? Will they show uh, up in the Oh, yeah. They showed up in oh my God. Uh, Scarlet Hollow. Um, oh, they do. In the general store, there's little, like, you know, stuffed animal containers, and there's a snake, a, a and cat, them. and an axolotl. So. And then they're, your cousin's cat in Scarlet Hollow is sort of like an AU version of our cat, where she. Um, she's remained yeah. French. She was French Canadian. I got her in <laughs> Quebec, and her name was Frufru when I first got her. Yeah. So that's the cat in the game now. It's Frufru, and yeah. she's much meaner than my oh, cat. So mean. Spoons is becoming <laughs> a little meaner because she's like twelve now. So mm. she's officially geriatric. Yeah, the, that's awesome. The audacity is real at that age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, before we go, uh, first of all, thanks so much for spending time with us and talking about your game. Um, when can everyone expect to play Slay the Princess, and uh, where can they play it? Um, so we will be announcing a release date in the near future, um, but sometime this year. And right Sweet. now, you can play the demo on Steam, GOG, or itch.io, mm -hmm. and it is available on windows linux and mac um and we have a release date yes we do, we do. <laughs> yeah it's decided it's, it's just not a uh, we aren't really sure so we're holding back that's not what we're doing yeah we know. you know we how it secrets. is you've gotta you've mm -hmm. gotta promise the release date to some exclusive window to get uh -huh. to get the big megaphone um yeah i have an idea yeah. but from no knowledge but um <laughs> I don't want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then we will probably be doing console ports for some time next year mm -hmm. and localizations in at least a few key languages um, nice. on awesome. top of that. Sweet. And where but can we they want follow to finish the game? the game and get all the bugs oh, done yeah. before yeah, yeah, we yeah, do yeah. that? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, where can they follow the game like on socials and, and keep up with the... Uh... <sighs> Let's see. Map. I don't know when this is going live, but if Twitter or X or yes. whatever it is yeah, still yeah, exists, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can find us at Black Tabby Games. Um, we are at Black Tabby Games uh, dot on Blue Sky as well, and Tumblr. There's a subreddit for both of our games individually. And for following the big updates, joining the Discord is a great idea. Or join our mailing list, oh, which yeah, I believe too. there is a link to on our website. Sweet. Nice. Thank you so much, Tony and Abby, for, for again, allowing us to show off your game. Uh, cannot wait to play it. Everyone else watching, uh, keep it here for more dev combos. And if you haven't, go check out the Mindy Indie Showcase. I'm sure it's somewhere here on the YouTube channel or at 61indie.com. 
slash showcase, which I think is the URL. If it's not, Mike's got some work to do. All right. <laughs> we love you very much. Play more indies. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Awesome. Thank you so much for, having, for us. having us. Bye.